Good evening, everyone. Really excited uh, to have uh, all of you here, and I'm excited. And even if you weren't here, I'd be excited to like think about these things and talk about these things. But it's even more exciting uh, to have all of you. Uh, the it's the uh, inspiration to teach this series of classes occurred over the summer. There was a uh, lecture, uh, and in the, it was an afternoon lecture. The women's philog group at the shul had a um, sponsored a, uh, a, a lecture by uh, Professor Sumkovich came. And she taught, and then that was followed by a uh, women's tefillah style mincha. And I think m most of the people who were at the lecture left and didn't stay for the women's mincha. And as I was um, chatting with uh, some people on the sidewalk, I mean, I obviously didn't stay, but I was, uh, you know, chatting with somebody who was sort of leaving. She, uh, and no, no, no one here, she, she said that she didn't really understand what is women's tefillah, like what is it, what's it from? And it was so interesting to me because in the 90s when, you know, it was, everyone knew what it was. It was at the heart of modern orthodox uh, polemics and, and discourse, and it was and 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 today, you know, engaged, you know, educated uh, modern orthodox Jews don't know what it is. So it occurred to me that there's part of parts of our recent history are not really well known or well understood. And by sort of taking a big, broad historical picture at some stories of our community, we could. Um, have a better sense of, of where we are as a community and where, and where we might choose to be headed, to, to head, um, or where we might want to go. Uh, so I just, sort of, <laughs> some books that, that were helpful to me, um, uh, I guess a few of them, just among like this, the most important, uh, Jeffrey Gurak is a professor of American Jewish history, teaches at Yeshiva University. He's published a number of articles on the history of American Judaism and history of orthodoxy. Uh, Orthodox Jews in America is an excellent book, well worth, uh, you know, your time. He recently published a chapter that's sort of like an epilogue to this book, where he, where he mentions me, which is kind of fun, uh, or something. Uh, uh, Adam Furziger is also a really interesting scholar. He's like a sociologist of American Judaism. Uh, this uh, beyond sectarianism, the realignment of American Orthodox Judaism. Fascinating, fascinating collection of essays. Really, really interesting. Well worth uh, reading. And then uh, the other one I'll just mention: um, Zev Elif, who is like this remarkably accomplished 30-something-year-old, um, someone in his 30s, uh, he's definitely younger than I am. He's here in Chicago now at um, the Hebrew Theological College in, in, in uh, and uh, okay, five, author of five books, okay? Um, and he's, I don't know, so I don't know how he does it, but this is like a, it's like a textbook for the history of modern orthodoxy. It's a collection of um, primary sources, organized by, by topic, by theme, and chronological. So it's an excellent, book to peruse and, and really, really, really useful. And the others I'll maybe mention uh, as they come up. <clears throat> and, but I will say, so he, he's in Chicago. I know him. He's a very friendly person, extremely helpful. In addition to writing this book and a number of really helpful articles that, to help, that help me understand this topic, uh, he also, uh, we exchanged emails this week, and he's a very helpful person. He's, you know, I, I could, and may yet, in some other context, bring him to Ajay Shalom and have him lecture himself, but I wanted to and in many ways, in most ways, he's much more qualified than I am to teach this material. Um, but I, I want to do it because I'd like to try to um, connect this, these historical episodes that we're going to contemplate with something about like the religious life of this community, right? So that's why I'd like to, it to be me rather than like the local expert who happens to be one of the national experts on the topic. Right? So, but. Uh, you, you, you know, he, he may come here at some point, I mean, I hope he does, because he's uh, a really interesting person. So, some background when we talk about orthodoxy. Uh, um, Jacob Katz, <laughs> I have one of his books here, one of his relevant books. Uh, this, is, this is A House Divided, which is Orthodoxy and Schism in 19th Century Central European Jewry. So this is the story of how orthodoxy emerges in, the, in Hungary in the 19th century. Uh, Orthodoxy is different from traditional Judaism. And that's Jacob Katz kind of like, that was one of his central insights that throughout his, his books, many of his books kind of revolve around that, that development. Orthodoxy is a response to modernity, okay? In Europe, in what? Orthodoxy is a response to modernity. Uh, Moderns, okay, like, uh, you know, 1789, the French Revolution, the Jews are emancipated in France, Napoleon uh, marches across Europe, wherever he goes, the ghetto walls are torn down, and Jews are emancipated. And it happens in different places in different countries, but by the end of the 19th century, uh, Jews are emancipated in much of Europe, certainly Central Europe and Western Europe, and eventually even in Eastern Europe. 
And with emancipation, the breakdown of the traditional, traditional Jewish society, secularization, all sorts of, you know, all sorts of uh, all the, um, the suite of changes that uh, characterize modernity, there, that causes a crisis in religion. The, uh, and orthodoxy is a reaction. It's one reaction to that, uh, that breakdown of traditional Judaism. The first reaction to, to the breakdown of traditional Judaism is the reform movement. The reform movement is older than orthodoxy. That's Jacob Katz's insight, and it's 100% true. Okay? Uh, the reform movement, in, as it emerges in Central Europe in the 1840s and 1850s, didn't cause the breakdown of tradition. It was a response to the breakdown of tradition. Now that the ghetto walls have come down, now that Europe is open to Jews, what does Judaism mean? And Reform Judaism, the Reform Movement, coalesced in the 19th century around a set of answers to that question. Judaism is ethical monotheism. Judaism is a religion, not a you know, tribe or a nation. Okay? That's, that's what Judaism means um, for us. Judaism is always a reforming, changing, shifting tradition. We're in the, we're the, and just as the rabbis remade Judaism after the temple, we are remaking Judaism in the aftermath of the Enlightenment. And, that, and the reform movement, again, yeah, didn't cause the breakdown of tradition. It was a response. It gave an answer to what, how Judaism could be relevant in the aftermath of the breakdown of tradition. Orthodoxy was a reaction to the reform movement in Central Europe. Orthodoxy says no, actually, even despite this, um, uh, despite the breakdown of tradition, we are still going to, um, we still believe in halakha, we still believe in the, uh, that, uh, the Torah, the written Torah and the oral Torah is the product of divine revelation, uh, and, and we're still going to maintain our customs and our practices in, despite the breakdown of tradition. That's, <coughs> different from traditional Judaism in some important ways. Traditional Judaism is unselfconscious. In traditional society, you don't, reflect, you don't have a choice. You don't reflect on what you're doing and why you're doing it. You just do it because everyone around you does it and you don't have options. You were, you know, um, when, when, when Spinoza was excommunicated by the Jewish community of Amsterdam, he didn't become a Christian. He stayed as a excommunicated secular Jew, he was like the first se like modern European person, perhaps, because he was kicked out of the Jewish community and he didn't have to become a Christian or Muslim. In the Middle Ages, that was impossible. Okay, so traditional Jewish life, the, there's the Kihila structure, it controls who's in and who's out, it collects taxes, you know, through the government and runs the communal institutions and you have no choice, you're not, you're not choosing how you're gonna practice, it's just non-reflective. It's you just do what everyone around you is doing uh, in carrying on tradition. Orthodox Jews are making a choice to coalesce, to circle the wagons around a set of practices, around a set of beliefs, and they're, and, and they're inspired to do that by you know, the reform response to modernity and, and in general the breakdown of tradition. That's Jacob Katz's thesis. This happens in Europe. In different countries it happens in different ways, uh, but it happens like, through, the, um, let's say, through the 19th century in Europe. So by the end of the 19th century you have you know, reform movement is very strong in Western Europe. Uh, it's not so strong in Eastern Europe. In Eastern Europe, you have other, um, you know, other. You, you have less. You don't have. You don't have a reform movement. You have like an Enlightenment. You have a more. You have secular Jewish identity. You have Jewish socialism. You have Zion. Zionism is also an alternative traditional Judaism. It's an alternative to, um, to to Orthodoxy. Certainly, in, in most most cases, uh, that's why the reason why. As an aside, the reason why there are so few reformed Jews in Israel is because Reform Judaism and Zionism were two different answers to the same question. Right? What's the relevance of Jewish life in the aftermath of tradition? Tradition has collapsed. Do we, you know, so what do we do? Do we all convert and become Christians, which thousands and thousands of Jews did in the 19th century? Or do we come up with some other new meaning of Judaism? Oh, so maybe the Reform Movement said Judaism is a modern European religion were Europeans of the Mosaic faith, and that's the reform. And, and the Zionists said, no, no, Judaism is a nationality, we're going to return to Eretz Israel and rebuild our national life there. So they're two, they, were, they were seen as mutually exclusive answers to the same question. And, you know, so in orthodoxy also, okay, a different answer to that same set of questions. And in the 19th century, this is well established in Europe, again, different countries, different places. So, what happens in America? That's the European story, okay? Which is not, which is like all the background, it's all the background. So you have, you have, again, you have the reform movement strong in Germany, strong in Western Europe. You have something called the Neolog movement in Hungary. The Neologs, you know, I think, uh, in their actual practice were kind of like, uh, we, today would be like modern Orthodox, but in 
Hungary in the 19th century, they were considered non-Orthodox, and they were really, and that's where the, the line was, was drawn. The Neologs were excluded from the Orthodox community, or the Orthodox uh, separated themselves from a connection with the Neolog movement. Uh, and um, one pattern that maybe exists is that in Protestant countries you have denominations, and in the Catholic and Russian Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox countries, you don't have as many denominations forming, but you have more, you know, you're like, more religious or less religious, or you're pro-religion or anti-religion, but religion is the thing, is sort of defined in a more traditional, stable way, whereas in the Protestant country where you have just like the, you know, just like you have the Methodists and the Episcopalians and the Lutherans and the Calvinists, you have different Jewish denominations forming as well. That, that, that pattern may be true. So in America, the reform movement becomes strong in America in the 1840s. 1840, you know, we have uh, 1848, you have a series of revolutions, liberal democratic revolutions throughout Europe. They all are suppressed. And a lot of these kind of liberal democratic types come to America, many from Central Europe, lots and lots of Germans. They help us win the Civil War, and they also bring Reform Judaism to the United States. And those Germans, as they become economically successful, they dominate American Judaism. American Judaism is a dominated by Reform in the 1850s, you know, by let's say the 1860s. In the 1880s, 1890s, turn of the 20th century, waves of Eastern European immigrants come. This is probably most of our ancestors, I would guess, came to this country in that wave between 1880 and 1914. Uh, and those Jews are traditional and they sort of bring a revival of orthodoxy to uh, the United States. So let's talk about the Mechitza, okay? Which emerge, which becomes, so this is all background, okay? So. How does the Mechitza become a defi dividing line between orthodoxy and non-orthodoxy in the United States? In Europe, it was not the Mechitza. The, Neol the reform congregations in Europe in the 90s, I think, still had women's galleries. Uh, the neologs certainly had women's sections in their synagogues, and they were not orthodox. I thought they are. Excuse me? Because the silver told me how to show. Neologs, you couldn't tell the difference. Ne in Hungary, you told me. It, there, was a, there was a show hate. What? There was a show hate. So in, in the, in the, the, there was a, story, was a case of a show hate who was hired by a neolog congregation to serve as a chazan on Rosh Hashanah, and his butcher shop was declared treif because he was, took a job at a nail lock. They were absolutely not considered part. But they were from people. Uh, you, yeah, that's your opinion. I, I'm just saying, like, the, the, okay, okay, I, I understand what you're saying. They, they, were observed, they were traditionally observant in a, in a standard that would be very recognizable and familiar to us. They were not orthodox, and they were excluded from orthodoxy in Hungary. And, and like, an entire communities split in traumatic ways and, and splits that were never healed between the Orthodox and the Neologs. So even though, right, so the difference, it wasn't about Mechitza, it was about other things. It was about choirs, it was about uh, where the bima was placed in the synagogue. In Hungary, that was, the, that was the defining point. We have the bima in the middle of the shul, it's an Orthodox synagogue. Neolog congregations, prayers were read from the front, uh, which was seen as imitating churches. Weddings taking place in synagogues, the Neologs had, had um, weddings inside, indoor weddings in synagogues, which was considered absolutely unacceptable by the Orthodox to have a wedding in a synagogue. Weddings take place outdoors, in the courtyard of the synagogue, under the sky, under the stars, right? What if it was uh, the cold raining? You wear a coat. <laughs> <laughs> John. How do you spell Neolog? N-E-O-L-O-G. I don't know. I think, I think without. This is the book about that. This is the story. Uh, Jacob Katz, A House Divided, is a story of the split between the Neologs and the Orthodox in Hungary. You can, this might be on that list, John, of the, John sounds collecting lists of books that are very impactful to me, so this, is, this might be one of them too. Uh, um, so in America, it wasn't the, you know, and, and just again, just to, just to draw that put at the bima in the middle of the shul, so that was, the, that was one of the defining dif distinction, orthodox shul and non-orthodox shul, where the bima is. Uh, in, in the 60s, 50s, 60s in the United States, Moshe Feinstein is asked about a synagogue that has the beam in the front of the shul, and he says, yeah, it doesn't really matter so much, not a big deal. In Hungary, it was really important, but here it's not so important, which is not, like, it's not hypocritical. It's just, he's saying, like, that was the issue around which a community coalesced, which signified deeper, more important differences here in the United States. There were other issues. The issue that, that Mechitza came to be uh, maybe one of those issues. So how did that happen? So eight minutes, so, And part, I guess, so part of this story is really the story of the emergence of the conservative movement as a distinct movement that's different from reform, different from orthodoxy. There is the older histories of the conservative movement tied it to 
the what was called the positive historical um, movement, in, which was a European Jewish trend. The Jewish Theological Seminary in Breslau, Zacharias Frankel, figures like that who were academically informed but traditionally observant, and and that was seen as like the the early histories of the American conservative movement saw it as the American you know transplant of that. European phenomenon. The more recent histories of the conservative movement say that's not true. <laughs> the conservative movement is a distinctly American movement that emerges in the 20th century and isn't really clearly distinct from orthodoxy until the 1950s. Um, and so 1883, you have that story of the, the mythical story, you know, of the, um, the first graduating class of Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati. This was the, um, uh, what's his name, Rabbi um, Isaac Mayer Wise one of the founders of American Reform Judaism, uh, although he didn't necessarily see himself as wanting to, maybe he saw himself as having a broader American uh, trans-denominational mission. Uh, Hebrew Union College, you know, which is still the main reform you know, seminary, uh, graduates first class and celebrated at what became known as the Trefa Banquet, because I think the first course, you ever know the story, it was like snails and frog's legs, and like it was every, you know, that, and, um, and the story is there are a bunch of traditionalists who were there at the banquet who got up in disgust and walked out, and that's the founding of the conservative movement. They, they wanted to be, you know, they were, they were there, right? They were there at the banquet because they, they thought this endeavor of the Hebrew Union College was a positive one, a more liberal, Americanized form of Judaism, but when they started trade food, they're like, oh, this, this is not, this is going too far. Um, the story, it's a little bit of an, you know, the, you know first of all, so he, he claimed it was all a mistake. He was supposed to, he ordered a kosher meal, but, you know, <laughs> you know it didn't happen. The chef, you know, ignored it or something. Uh, and the other thing, apparently, what, Rabbi Wise kept a kosher home. And one of the traditionalists who actually stormed out of the meal, uh, like, I think, years later, still had, still ate at, at his house. Um, so it's sort of, so it's, so it's, it's not quite as um, stark a, a dividing point as maybe the stories have. 1902, Solomon Schechter comes uh, to America, becomes the president of uh, the Jewish Theological Seminary. Um, he is attacked by the Agudat Rabbani, the Agudas Rabbanim, which was a, and still is, a um, right-wing Orthodox rabbinic organization. So they were attacking JTS, they were attacking Solomon Schechter as early as 1904. That also, though, isn't really <laughs> what makes a new movement begin, because they were attacking they were also attacking um, people to the right of, you know, they were attacking graduates of Yeshiva University's rabbinical school also. Um, graduates of Rabbi Yitzhak Al-Khanan Theological Seminary, the modern orthodox rabbinical school associated with Yeshiva University, uh, were also not, were also subject to criticism by the Agudah Rabbanim. They weren't allowed to join the Agudah Rabbanim and the Rabbinical Council of America, which today is like the large mainstream centrist uh, modern orthodox organization, was founded in 1936 by graduates of Yeshiva University who couldn't get, weren't admitted into the Abedas Rabbanim because they were more Americanized and they spoke English and they shaved maybe and et cetera, wore neckties and stuff like that. Um, 1913, the United States of, of Conservative Judaism was founded. 1918, the Rabbinical Assembly, which is basically a JTS, was a JTS alumni association, was founded. But then in the 1920s, through, except for a period of years in the 1920s, there were negotiations for the merger of JTS and Yeshiva University. So after Solomon Schechter, after he's attacked by the Godus of Rabbanim, after the Rabbinical Assembly is established, after the United States of Conservative Judaism is established, people thought, like reasonable people thought that JTS and Shiva University were, you know, had like similar enough missions that they should just be combined and that would be a more efficient way of doing things. Um, so the negotiations failed, it didn't happen, but you know, the fact that the conversations could happen, you know, a decade later, two decades later, the, the, the idea would be preposterous, I think, to, to many, right? It would be preposterous. Yes? What were the issues that separated them? Separated whom? Or JTS and... Not very many at all. Uh, you know, I think Solomon Schechter was more open to academic historical analysis of, of Jewish law and Jewish history, but he, you know, in a way that was uncomfortable to some. Uh, but, but those are very subtle, you know, that, like where... There were also figures, certainly in Europe, who were, um, who managed to remain, consider, you know, in the Orthodox fold, who also dabbled in uh, some of that history. You know, so for example, uh, David Zvi Hoffman, who died in 1931 or so, was the senior rabbinic figure at the Berlin uh, Hildesheimer Rabbinical Seminary, a modern Orthodox rabbinical school in Berlin, 
and he had a PhD in Jewish history. He wrote an academic, academic scholarship on the Tosefta, uh, right? So, so, so the line, again, not, not quite so, 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 so black and white, where, where, what was, what type of historic, you know, um, academic scholarship was undermining a faith and consistent with faith and what was acceptable? It's not so obvious. You made reference to Lechitza. Yeah. I mean, as being the defining thing. Haven't gotten, Haven't gotten there yet. Haven't gotten there yet. Haven't gotten there yet. Because, um, because many Orthodox synagogues had mixed seating, and it wasn't, therefore, it was not in the early 20th century, and so it wasn't a uh, defining, defining point. So let's see how it starts becoming a defining point. The first real point you can, where you can say this is made, you know, 19, um, 1927 to 1929, you have the Cleveland Jewish Center court case. This was like the Scopes Monkey Trial of, of Judaism. Okay, there was lots and lots of coverage in the Jewish press, and it dragged on for years, went up and down the court system, and it, it, we have here the, you know, it's incredible. All the, all the you know, the JTA is, is like all their archives are online, so it's pretty cool. You can, so here's the, here's the November 4th, 1927. Oh wow, it's almost exactly um, uh, 90 years ago and like three days, okay? Um, right? The friction on theological grounds obtaining throughout the country between strictly orthodox congregations and those termed conservative affiliated with the United Synagogue of America is being aired preparatory to trial which will begin in the Cleveland courts on November 15th. The taking of depositions by rabbis and laymen, leaders of the orthodox and conservative wings in New York began yesterday at the Manhattan Square Hotel for the forthcoming trial in the suit of a group of orthodox members of the Cleveland Jewish Center against Rabbi Solomon Goldman, spiritual leader of the congregation. So members of the shul are suing their rabbi because they think he's not orthodox. Hmm. And they have membership rights in the congregation. The bylaws of the congregation say it's an Orthodox congregation. So they feel that the rabbi and the leadership is violating the bylaws, and therefore they, the bylaws, you know, it's incorporated as a nonprofit organization under the laws of the state of Ohio, and so therefore they're suing in the court. The conflict between the Orthodox group and the rabbi date back two and a half years. The congregation, which had been in existence 50 years, has built the Jewish center in which it was stated a million dollars, was a million dollars in 1927. That was, uh, that was real money. Just as an aside, there are a lot of beautiful, beautiful Jewish buildings from 1926, 1927, 1928, leading up to um, the Great Depression, right? So I think Temple Shalom was built, uh, and I think actually Emmett also, the, the old building were built also in the 20s. Uh, and yeah, just thinking in New York, you know, Yeshiva University has that one beautiful building which was built in the 20s, and then I think the plan was for like lots of buildings like that, a whole like Gothic campus, you know, like, and then it's just that one building. And, so, okay. A committee of the Orthodox members, including A.A. Katz, A. Lifkowitz, Sobel, Scheinbart, filed a suit against Rabbi Goldman, alleging that he is diverted from the constitution of the congregation, which provides that as long as 10 members will insist on the Orthodox ritual, the congregation is to remain Orthodox. The committee insists that the center continue to do the Orthodox ritual. The present board of the center and Rabbi Goldman contend that the mode of worship, ritual, and practice introduced by Rabbi Goldman is in accordance with traditional Judaism. So. Right? Let's go. What are you going to do? The trial, the first of its kind in the United States, will thus have to be decided on the question of what constitutes orthodoxy. It is in an effort to secure this definition, the court has authorized Walter Hamilton, a Cleveland lawyer, a non-Jew, who represents the plaintiffs to reside over the taking of depositions for witnesses called by both parties. Um, okay. Testimony of Dr. Drachman, Rabbi Leo Young. Rabbi Leo Young, very important. Rabbi Leo Young uh, is, uh, was the rabbi of the Jewish Center. He also later on went on to become chief rabbi of the uh, United Kingdom, I believe. <laughs> Uh, Rabbi Margolis, Rabbi Margolis is the, was, the, uh, was the father of, he was, he was, he was like the Ramah school is named after him, I think, I think, or was his, he remember his father or something? Uh, Rabbi Ezra Silver of Springfield, um, Rabbi Seltzer of the Union of Orthodox Rabbis, Rabbi Herbert Goldstein of the Union of Orthodox Congregations, and Mr. Gedalia Bublik, editor of the Orthodox Jewish Daily News. Okay, it's been taken. The witnesses are asked to answer to 33 questions which pertain to the charges brought by the Orthodox Committee against Rabbi Goldman. Among the charges are that Rabbi Goldman has denied the Sinaitic origin of the Torah and the Decalogue, that's serious, that he had permitted men and women to sit together in the synagogue, that he has abolished the saying of grace at public dinners, that he had abolished the priestly benediction at the synagogue services, and that he kisses the brides after forming the marriage ceremony. <laughs> Thirty-three charges. Why does the mechitza become the issue? Why, why, why is the mechitza merge? Uh, this and actually, this I believe this eventually it was. I don't think this case ended up being decided by 
in the courts, I think the courts thought this was like a religious question and not something they had ability to decide. Um, Melchitza, though, ends up, well, just like, I'm going to be able to say this, so uh, Rabbi Ryan, Aaron Ryan was at Kins here in, here in Chicago, 1940, in my opinion, that while the orthodoxy sorry, must strive to retain the tradition of separate pews wherever possible, a synagogue may still be labeled orthodox if this is lacking, provided that the other factors I outlined are present. So we felt you have to believe in, you know, in the divine origin of the Torah, and you have to maintain an orthodox style of worship, but, you know, Kins, which hadn't exceeding until the 1970s, uh, he felt, you know, he, you know, obviously, you know, the rabbi of Kins felt it was not an essential characteristic of orthodox. Yes? Did Kins have mixed seating, or yes. did it have no mechitza separate? I'm not sure. Okay. I don't know. I wasn't here. I don't know. Uh, okay. Mixed, mixed. All right. That's very, yeah. Uh, sure. um, do, you think, do you think, like, Kins is an example of this kind of weird anomaly in Chicago or in some other Midwestern cities of traditional Judaism, which is separate from the conservative movement and orthodoxy, that you have here the new synagogue and some of those are Yeah, so that, 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 yes, I mean, it, clearly it is, and that, that does become very, um, my sense of how that, that comes a little bit later. I think once orthodoxy kind of becomes, like, associated with mechitza, synagogues that didn't want to put it in a mechitza, but didn't want to affiliate conservative, called themselves traditional. And that was a way to, in Hungary, just as a somewhat parallel, just okay, this is 45 seconds. In the 1860s, right, Jews are emancipated from Hungary, in Hungary, the Hungarian, Austro-Hungary, right, Hungary, okay? Uh, the government says, okay, you, you can be free, and we'll have a national organization of Jews, and we'll take taxes, and we'll support your institutions, your synagogues, your cemeteries, your nursing homes, and, and, uh, and there'll be a national organization of Jews that the government will, will help you set up. Now, you're welcome. So, the Orthodox, in 1870, I believe, 1871, won the right in the Hungarian parliament to separate and secede from the national Jewish organization that was being formed because they didn't want to be in the same organization with the neologues. Um, and they got the right to form their own separate, they were now, so instead of one national organization of Jews that would be supported by the, set up by the government in Hungary, there were now two, one Orthodox and one non-Orthodox, which meant that every single congregation, every single community had to decide which of the two organizations they were going to join, the big one, the mainstream one, or the Orthodox, smaller one. Uh, this meant that, and, and what meant, ended up happening was communities were split in two, which meant the cemetery and the synagogue and the school and the right orphanage all had to be split into all the community's assets in terms of, you know, and if you were your great, great grandparents and, you know, 10 generations buried in the same cemetery, too, too bad, like, you know, if you're Orthodox or if you're non-Orthodox, like everything, all, everything, were, communities were split. There were some communities, they voted to join neither organization and they called themselves status quo. Okay. Right, which was a thing. So they were, they didn't want to, didn't join, and, and they were doing just what, like, you know, 10 years ago, 100 years ago, we weren't part of one, any of these organizations, because they didn't exist. So we're going to continue to do, they were also excluded by the Orthodox. They, they weren't, you know, and, and that's what they, you know, Shochet, you, your, your food wasn't kosher. If you were, I think that was the case. I think it was, it was a Shochet who served as a chaz in a status quo congregation, and one of the major posts said, you know, you can't, can't trust his kosher, because he's not, you know, affiliating. So the tradition, it's a little bit like that. They didn't want to, Jordan, I think, like the traditional, and, you know, but there's also another, there's also a DAF, the Midwestern element, which we'll come to uh, later. Rabbi, yes? Uh, I lived in West Frederick's Park from 1959 to 1962, and I attended Kins off and on. Uh, the men sat on the left side, the women sat on the right side, and those who wanted to sit together sat in the middle. Okay, that's interesting. It's like a three. Um, Evelyn. <coughs> yes, yes, sure, I will. Yes, I was, I was planning to and I will. Maybe this is a good time for that. So, um, um, is this the right time to do that? I as well. So, let, let's, so. Nineteen fifty-seven. If you see the timeline here, things are happening. You know, Mordechai Kaplan is excommunicated by the Gudas of Rabbanim in nineteen forty-five. Very, very liberal. Um, element, you know, faculty member at JTS, and that certainly didn't like help their reputation with the Orthodox. He stayed on the faculty um, for many, many. You know, he lived to a very old age. Nineteen fifty-seven. You have the Matt Clements court case in uh, in Michigan, which was another one of these Mechitza court cases, 
And here the court did adjudicate and did side on behalf of the orthodox plaintiffs. And I think part of why, of all the elements that, you know, in, in the uh, Cleveland Jewish Center case, right, 33 questions about orthodoxy and non-orthodoxy, Mechitza becomes the one that is a dividing line, in part because, um, well, I guess, wh wh why would you, I guess before we, I mean, I guess, we'll talk about the halakha in a moment, I'll just, I'll just um, I mean, mechitza is almost, you, you, it, there's almost no, I'll just say this, like you can barely find any reference to a mechitza in any halakha literature um, before the 20th century. Okay, I'll just say that. I'll say, before modernity, Jews, as far as we know, prayed in separate gender spaces everywhere in the world. That's true. Uh, it's also true that you will not find it discussed in halakha literature um, with a few, with like almost no, like very, very rare exceptions uh, until the 20th century. So I don't know that the halakha is necessarily the reason why this became the dividing line, but we'll talk, we'll talk a little about the halakha. Um, uh, any other suggestions? Yes? The Gemara, Mechitz and the Gemara is not describing uh, something that has to be in a synagogue for prayer. Mechitz and the Gemara, that's the definition of a barrier, that is true, correct. We'll talk about we'll talk about the definition of mechitz in the context of shul and why ten tzachim is or is not a uh, good uh, um, definition for shul. We'll talk about that. We'll, we'll get to it. Um, What's the question? Well, why did mechitz become sort of? I mean, I'm sort of you know. I mean, I, I have a theory which I'm going to share with you. Yeah. Why why did it become? I think maybe because it was, a, it was a new thing that that women were prominently coming to shul. That was only the 20th century. Before that, that wasn't the case, and so it wasn't this. So there's sort of a Proto-feminism in the 19, 1950s. It's not really. It would call it. You know, it's it's uh, it's the era of. Um, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Mordechai Kaplan's daughter is about as well in like 1921. Yeah, so yeah. Like, she didn't read Torah. She didn't do anything. But she's still calling it a hot mitzvah. <laughs> therefore, what? Therefore, you're you're saying that's. I'm a, just saying that like it seems like there's things are happening. Lives, like right? yeah, there is like this. There's all those like, women right? cutting their hairs in the 1920s and and in the you know the 50s. It was it was it was not I don't, you know it was I don't know if it was like feminist per se as it was um, you know it was like uh, you know think of like Eisenhower and like you know suburbia and like. like the family that prays together, mm -hmm. stays together, mm -hmm. and you go, either, it doesn't matter whether you're a Catholic Protestant, it was a Catholic Protestant Jew, it doesn't matter what you are as long as you pray and you're a good American and you hate the communists and you show that by everyone going to their house of worship together as a family on their Sabbath day. And so, like, in that context, like, there's this pressure that, like, yeah, the, you know, women are, like, the synagogue should be a, a place where the whole family comes, where maybe in, like, in uh, a generation earlier, the men went to the base measures to daven, while women weren't as maybe involved in, in that in certain places. Um, and so therefore, then it becomes like, how are we going to include women in synagogue life with a, maintaining a separation or not? That's a very interesting theory and probably has a lot of uh, validity. Um, but it's still a major change. We're talking, there was no such thing as a mixed senior orthodox before this time. Well, except there were mixed eating Orthodox shuls, and so why somehow they, until they got defined as non-Orthodox, right? And so, in other words, there were a lot of mixed Orthodox shuls with mixed eating, and everyone thought of them as Orthodox shuls. Where in Europe? Oh no, in America, in America, it was new. In other words, it was it was it was okay it until it became wasn't okay. Meaning it was. But it was an American. It was an American, American, American phenomenon. It was an American phenomenon. So maybe therefore it became yeah. Well, so the distinction then could have been not Orthodox versus not, but New World versus Old World. Old world. Could which is what the traditional, yeah. which is what people this were saying, exactly, right. Just like, just like in Europe, you know, there's a story, uh, Ron Cutler went with some of his, you know, uh, his students in the 50, I guess the 50s or 60s to a shochet to, uh, you know, to oversee a shechit of chicken. And Ravaran saw the chicken the shochet was shechting, and it looked different, it was a different kind of chicken than the chickens he had known growing up in Europe. And you know, this, you know I this one. And he said, uh, he started yelling. This is this, this is a chicken. You know, this is like I I knew chickens in Europe. This is a, this, this bird looks different. Like, why do you think it's kosher? This is like a different bird than what we call chickens in Lithuania. And the shochet pointed to the students who had come to Ravaran and said, "You think those are Shiva students? <laughs> those are Bachrim? <laughs> you know, those don't look like the Bachrim. You know, so and like America was different. People, had, you know, people dressed differently. They thought differently. They, um, you know." So maybe this is just part of Americanized Judaism, right? Just like uh, there's a sermon in the vernacular, right? I mean, that's all sorts of, you know. So um, you could be cynical and say that orthodoxy defines itself 
uh, you know, around you know where the presence of women and what women do, and uh, and it's not cynical. It's just that's just a, that's a sort of critical lens that one could look at our community. And there's a certain uh, over time that that certainly seems to be a strong dynamic of how our community defines itself by what women do and where and when and how. Uh, I think that's that's an unfortunate dynamic that should be, I think, pushed back against, that we should have some more positive affirmation about our community than, uh, and, what and our values than just th than, than that. Uh, I think a really significant issue of why Mechitza became the dividing line is because the courts can judge it. <laughs> you can adjudicate it. Is there a Mechitza? Is there not? Are the women sitting separately or are they sitting mixed? And you can take your synagogue to court and sue them if there's mixed seating um, because it's something clear and objective. It's not. Is the rabbi, you know, the, does the rabbi believe in that the Torah comes from Sinai? How on earth are you going to, you know, like prove that in court? You know, the rabbi starts talking about, you know, divine inspiration and a metaphor of that, you know, like, you know, the court's not going to judge that. But the court will say, there isn't, like, that yes or no, the men are sitting separately or not. And therefore, denominations, which are often, like, are, are about things like, like communal assets and who owns them and, what, you know, right, and, and how they get divided um, and, and suing each other in court in the United States to like work that out. So mechitz is something that is very easy for a court to, to render judgment on, and they do. And so 1957, there's a mechitz trial. I have here, um, starting on page seven, I have, or six, I have, the, the book is published, 1959, Barak Litvin was one of the, uh, Lit the uh, I think he was, he was like one of the guys who sued his synagogue. He published this massive book uh, kind of like celebrating his victory and sort of like a guide for other synagogues and other congregations. So it's, you know, it's like it collects, uh, and you can see it's, you know, all the leading rabbis of the late 50s, um, letters from all over the world, uh, lots of sources, um, again, from Israel, from Europe, from New York, um, and then historical background, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and this is supposed to be, and then he also at the end, he also has um, the actual, um, the briefs and some of the court documents as well. So I, have, I gave you the table of contents. This entire um, book is available free online in like 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 a dozen or I don't know, several dozen PDFs. So if you're inspired, you can go find it, you can read it, you can also buy it. Like the book exists, um, and this marks an era in which this becomes starts becoming a, a defining issue. Uh, printed in that book, and I also gave you from Zabels. So you have uh, starting on page um, starting on page four, uh, you have. Um, Rabbi Soloveitchik's uh, um, kind of response to this. Very, very strict um, position that he took on behalf of separate seating. Um, I mean, the case is, case he, you know, the opening he opens. A young man moves into a suburb of Boston where the only existent synagogue had men and women sitting together. He asked me what he should do on the high holidays, Rosh Hashanah and Kippur. Until then, on account of them exceeding, he had not entered the synagogue. But on the days of awe, he was very reluctant to remain at home. I answered him that it was better for him to pray at home, both Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and not cross the threshold of that synagogue. A few days later, he telephoned me again. He had met the man who was to sound the shofar in that synagogue. And this man who warned him that if he had not come to the synagogue, he simply would not hear the shofar at all. For the man would not sound the shofar again privately for his benefit. The young man practically implored me that I grant permission to enter the edifice, at least for a half hour, that he might hear the shofar. I hesitated not for a moment, but directed him to remain at home. It would be better not to hear the shofar than to enter a synagogue whose sanctity has been profaned. My stringent position regarding the mingling of men and women arises from several reasons. First of all, such mingling is forbidden according to the halakha. In certain instances, biblical law prohibits praying in a synagogue when men and women are seated together. Such a locale has none of the sanctity of the synagogue. Any prayers offered there are worthless in the eyes of Jewish law. Um, stream, right? Secondly, the separation of the sexes in the synagogue derives historically from the sanctuary where there were both a court of women and a court of Israelites in the Beit HaMikdash. It is in its martyr's history of a thousand years, the people of Israel have never violated this sacred principle. Moreover, when primitive Christianity arose as a sect in the Holy Lands and began to solely introduce reforms, one of the innovations which the sect established at once in the externals of synagogue practice was to have men and women sit together. In many instances, mixed seating was the unmistakable sign which a Jew could recognize that he had found not a place of sanctity for Jews to pray, but rather a prayer house for a deviating sect. For in those times, the Christians had not yet formally differentiated themselves from traditional Jewry. As a secret sect, they endeavored to hide their ideology. Da -da 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 -da. Thirdly, the entire concept of family pews is in contradiction to the Jewish spirit of prayer. Prayer means communication with the master of the world and therefore with the withdrawal from all and everything. During prayer, man must feel alone, removed, isolated. He must then regard the creator as an old friend from whom alone he can hope for support and consolation. 
Behold, as the eyes of servants look into the hands of their master, as the eyes of a maiden unto the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look unto the Lord our God until he be gracious unto us. It's not about sitting with your family um, in Eisenhower's America. Clearly the presence of women among men or of men among women, which often evokes a certain frivolity in the group, either in spirit or in behavior, can contribute little to sanctification or the deepening of religious feeling, nor can it help until the mood in which, instill them that mood in which a man must be immersed when he would communicate with the Almighty. Out of the depths of I call thee, O Lord, says the psalmist, such a state of okay. um, And then he goes on to say that he thinks that um, this can be a battle, right? This is the hill you want to die on, right? You know, this, this, this is the fight that orthodoxy has to wage, uncompromising around Mechitza. Again, halakhically, it's a, it's a weak case. Um, there's really not much is written. Uh, the Beit HaMikdash had several, you know, there, there was a Ezra Nashim where when, when we were, and there was the Ezra, you know, the Kohanim, Ezra Israel, where women did not go in the Beit HaMikdash. Um, we don't have a, oh, excuse me? But then the Ezra. Ezra. Yes, the Ezra Nashim was where women and men were, and then the Ezra Israel was where only men were, that's true. So it's not exact. And then on Simchat Beit HaShoiva, when they had the dancing on um, Sukkot, there was a balcony built where, where women only were. Okay, so that, that, that was true, but that was once a year, it was a time of dancing, it was not in the other times of the year. Um, in the Ezra Nashim, women uh, and men were, were present. Um, I think a lot of the archaeological evidence is a little bit equivocal. He may not have known that at the time. I think a lot of the early archaeology of the ancient synagogue assumed that there were uh, separation and therefore, you know, the archaeologists say, oh, this must be like the staircase to the women's balcony, you know, like, you know, but it was, it, I think some of the more newer archaeology says that there's really no evidence of what was or wasn't present in the ancient synagogue. We don't really know so much. In the medieval synagogue, you know, we, we do know, we do know more. So he's right about that in terms of the history. Uh, but because it was so common, it wasn't written about halakhically. There's very, again, very, very few references to almost none of the mechitza in The argument that men and women sitting together is Christian <laughs> is do doesn't seem very, very firm. Because Christians also had separate seating yeah. in certain places. Correct. You're absolutely right. Correct. Correct. Uh, yes. In, conser in the conservative movement started counting women in a minion in the 70s, I believe. Oh, so that was more early. Uh, mm -hmm. 70s or 80s, setting 70s. I'm not positive of that history. Not all. Before, <laughs> not all of them. Even today, not all of them. In but my reform Hebrew school, they started recruiting girls in 1974 because they had a daily afternoon minion of some old men, but there were only about eight of them. Fascinating. So they needed 1974. Okay, that's living history. Cool. <laughs> awesome. Um, as people start writing about Mechitza, just in terms of like what it's about, so you have some, you have basically three theories of what Mechitza is about in the synagogue. Like one position, you have a position of the Hungarians and the Hasidim that a Mechitza is to prevent men from seeing women during prayer, that that would be sexually distracting, and so Mechitza is to prevent men from seeing women. If that's the purpose of Mechitza, so this Mechitza obviously wouldn't be effective in that. Uh, you'd have a balcony and you'd have a curtain, it has to be opaque, uh, you know, although it can be creative, the Boston Rebbe in, in Boston, had, when he got, um, when the John Hancock Tower was being built, not the Boston John Hancock Tower was being built, it had the, the original, uh, it had these like glass windows, uh, which I think were defective and they had to replace them, and he got a hold of a few of the window panes <laughs> and installed them as his mechitza, so it's a one-way, uh, it's like a mirror, one-way mirror. So, so the women can see very, have very clear sight lines. They can see straight through, and the men have just a mirror, so they can't see uh, the women. Uh, the problem, I think, is that if you're, I think, for a woman to be praying and to have a man like walking up and, and like, looking at his teeth, you know, like, <laughs> not realizing that you're inches away from his face, would be a little distracting. So that, that's that's a, it's a Hasidic uh, Hungarian uh, perspective. You have the perspective that the shul is a Migdash Ma'ad. Our synagogue is modeled on the Beit HaMikdash. And so just as the Ezra Yisrael and the Beit HaMikdash only had men, it was divided from the Ezra Nashim uh, by basically a 10 tefach kind of uh, staircase. So you just have separate rishiyot. A men's section, a women's section has to be a different rishut. And so anything that's big enough to define a rishut, like a 10 tefach mechitza could be sufficient, but it also has to meet, meet all the strictures of a different, of a mechitza uh, that would be kosher for a sukkah, for example. So it can't be a, a curtain that doesn't, that hangs from the ceiling and doesn't go down to the floor, uh, would not be a kosher mechitza based on this uh, understanding because you can't, use, right, because it billows, it's not tied to the ground, it's not totally right, so, so there are, it's lenient but also strict. It has to, it has to be a, a mechitza as that rule is applied in Erevin, or could you have it sort of a petach, a mechitza, pro, I don't know, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> oh, sorry, okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, when you 
no seats in the basement, but there was no seats. There's no seats, that's true. Third position, the third position is what Moshe Feinstein uh, presents, and I think Russell Levachik is getting to it here, it alludes to it, is that the Mechitza uh, is about Kalat Rosh. Prayer can't take place in an environment, the Mishnah says already, an environment of Kalat Rosh. Kalat Rosh means lightheadedness, but not, or frivolity, or, or, or um, joyous kind of levity, and that environment is inconsistent with prayer, and a mixed gender environment, sex environment is, mixed gender environment is, uh, is conducive to Kalat Rosh, and separation enhances COVID Rosh, uh, somber seriousness, and, and that's, uh, and, hmm? and, and, and Kavana, and, and the, Definition there for Moshe is that you just has to be high enough to prevent intermingling, but seeing is okay. And so he says 54 inches, and Rosh Hashanah, I think, said 40 inches. And they're all different standards, but they're about um, preventing people from mixing. It's not about preventing sight. So that, that's like a moderate. That's like becomes the dominant position in, in American Orthodoxy. Um, so I want to say one other thing historically, then maybe something else uh, not historically. So. Nonetheless, so we have a series of cases in the 50s, like what do I have in the timeline I have here? Uh, 1959, this book is published. 19, between 1945 and 1965, the number of conservative congregations grows from 350 to 800. So this doesn't seem to, it's not a winning generation, you know, dec, you know, decade for a generation for American Orthodox. This was the time, the ascendancy of the conservative movement where it becomes dominant with the children of immigrants uh, from 350 to 800 congregations. That's probably about as many they have now. Uh, between 1945 and 1965. However, between 1955 and 1965, there were 30 Orthodox congregations in Stal Mechitzo. So, so they take that step. They kind of, they had been Orthodox, and they decided it was time to have a Mechitzo, so 30 of them, which is, you know, not, 1964, Lincoln Square Synagogue is founded as a mixed seating synagogue. Uh, this is Rabbi Riskin's, um, like, sort of autobiography. It's not, it's, it's an interesting book. It's an interesting genre. It's an autobiography, but it's, it's an autobiography comprised of like maybe a hundred inspiring short little stories. So it's an interesting way of writing an autobiography. And they're, they're fun stories. I and mean, I heard him say many of them like personally, which, is kind of, which makes it extra fun for me. Um, uh, except there's, a, there's this disclaimer at the front saying, this is how I remember them. I'm not really sure it happened this way. So, so it's, like, it's like, like they're stories. They're really nice stories, but it's not, it's not like a history book. And he didn't try to write. But he, so he tells the founder of Lincoln's person, which became under his guidance and still to this day a major, major Orthodox synagogue in New York. It, you know, it was a guy who was turned away on Rosh Hashanah because he didn't have, didn't have a ticket. They got very angry, so he was going to form his own synagogue. And they thought, we can get an Orthodox rabbi for much cheaper. Let's get an Orthodox rabbi. And Yeshiva University said, go to Rabbi and go to the, I want you to go there, but <coughs> don't move into the neighborhood until they put him a, put, put him a pizza. <coughs> don't pray in that synagogue until they have a pizza, but you can be the rabbi. He died early, and then he went and he spoke and he led services and you know, and he lived up in Washington Heights and spent Shabbat in a hotel every week. <coughs> the synagogue grew, and eventually they they voted to put in the chitza, but it was like several, it was a several year process, and it, and you know, and, it, and that's you know, and it, and it thrived as, as an Orthodox a synagogue, even though it was founded by people who were not really Orthodox. They just they wanted an Orthodox rabbi because it was cheaper. But he described also the Rosh so Hashanah was involved in the approval of his initially going to the non-Orthodox synagogue to kind of capture it and you know, get a mechitza put in, but under certain conditions, he split the Babacher Rebbe encouraged him to go to Lincoln Square under these uh, conditions as well. 1969, uh, Rabbi Avi Weiss, who, um, you know, my teachers and someone who's you know, visited uh, an Ashish Shalom grandfather, you know, lately grandfather, um, was serving at a congregation in uh, St. Louis, or near St. Louis, called um, uh, Krevkor. Um, traditional synagogue of Krevkor, which is just in the suburb of St. Louis. The, sorry, the, the photocopy didn't come out so well. Uh, page 12. And they, I'll read it to So this is a letter from, uh, from Yeshiva University to uh, Hebrew Theological College in, in uh, Skokie. The purpose of this letter is to advise you of the current problem with the traditional synagogue of Krevkor, immediately outside of St. Louis, Missouri, a new congregation with which we have been in contact since its inception, where one of our young musmachim, Rabbi Avi Weiss, has been serving as spiritual leader this past year. Rabbi Weiss accepted this post for the express purpose of instituting a regular mechitza into this congregation, which until now has a rather anomalous setup whereby portable plastic mechitzas are used to sort of box in a number of men, then a number of women, etc. I think you would sit down and you would put up your mechitza like around your seat. <laughs> 
like, what's that game? It's like, it's like what? It's like, like, it's like a board game like that, right? Where you kind of, right? So, um, um, it wasn't uncommon to have a men's section, a women's section, and a mixed correct, section correct, correct, in yes. shoals. Yes. And I think they're describing a portable mafitza that might be expanded. I think or it was. Even, I think it was even more portable. I've heard Rabbi Weiss describe. I think it was something you could you could you would put it into your like next to your seat into your armrest, and it would sort of like so it could be it was even more portable. Like you could kind of you know. Um, in the same general seating site, the rabbi has done outstanding work in providing leadership for the congregation during the course of the year, but he has not yet been able to achieve his goal, which was to implement the new regular mechitza in the new building being contemplated. The last word in their negotiations regarding the new building was that the congregation would, would set one section aside with the mechitza with the rest of the sections to have mixed seating. This is unacceptable to the rabbi and to our office, especially since Rabbi Robert Hurt, our director of new communities, just visited the congregation to make specific recommendations which have now been unanimously declined. If the rabbi does not achieve his goal, he will leave the community and Yeshiva University will not send any candidates to this pulpit. It is conceivable that the congregation will con contact the Hebrew Theological College of Skokie, Illinois for candidates immediately after the rabbi advised them that he will leave, or perhaps even now before he has officially told them so that they might deal with him from a position of strength to gain the upper hand over him in preserving their own ideas. <laughs> I am therefore asking that the Hebrew Theological College decline recommendation of any candidate to this position, either now or in the future, until such time as the Mechitz is properly installed in this congregation. By our holding line together, there's a good chance that this sacred goal may be achieved, especially when they learn that they cannot undercut religious standards and make traditional Judaism in their own image of their preparation, and that of your staff in this matter will be deeply appreciated by Yeshiva University and will hopefully help achieve a Kiddush Hashem. With warmest thanks, da -da -da. okay, Robert Dabrinsky. Um, so this was 1969. In fact, Yeshiva University by then, it was take, it took a more hardline stance, would send rabbis to mixed seating congregations if they had a year, and give them a year to put in mechitza or leave. Hebrew Theological College continued to send people to mixed, rabbis to mixed seating congregations. That's the, I think, when the traditional synagogues kind of, and they were very popular in the Midwest because HGC here sent a lot of rabbis mm. to these congregations. Yeshiva mm. University sent rabbis to the coasts. Mm. HGC sent rabbis to a lot of areas in the Midwest. I think this congregation was the only Orthodox synagogue built in, like, in its time that had a mechitza from the very beginning of, of, of its building. Um, I guess I want to come back in the two minutes I have left. So offer just like, like you know, you know, sort of what, what this sets up. You know, so the Vachik's le that, that, that letter that we read from is so extreme. So like this, this, this young man is not going to fulfill his biblical obligation to hear Shofar and Rosh Hashanah, you know, just by standing in this, you know, uh, in, in this uh, synagogue. I, I, I it seems extreme and it and it and at the time it maybe it even seemed like a mistake because this is you know the conservative movement was just capturing synagogue after synagogue. You know, in suburbia, as people, Jews are moving to the suburbs, they're flocking to conservative synagogues in, in, in droves, you know, tripling their numbers in, in a, in a, in a, from 350 to 800 in, in a generation. Uh, ultimately, though, I think kind of throwing down the gauntlet and saying that they're going, there's going to be something that we're going to, that you know, defines some element of the way we pray together, that we're going to not Americanize, not alter this core aspect of the way our synagogue lives have been constructed, and we're going to even be, and we're going to be extreme about it, I think ended up being necessary uh, to like preserve a kernel of orthodoxy at a time when orthodoxy was very small, very weak, and shrinking, and that kernel allowed it to, to, kind of, to, to have a, a def definition that it was important to say that like, boundaries are useful. You know, often we don't like boundaries because we like, we like to get along with everyone, we like to be friends with everyone, we want everyone to be happy, but, but sometimes you, boundaries are necessary for having a set identity and to know who, who one is and, who, and, and where one is headed and, and what one's, um, uh, who are one's compatriots, compatriots in, in a spiritual journey. Uh, and th they, there were a few other similarly clearly, right, a synagogue with a mechitza was going to have a rabbi who had been trained in a certain way and was going to be, and that was going to, who was going to encourage the congregation in a certain direction of spiritual development that 
the liturgy would be take place in a certain, it was a, became a sign of other things that were more difficult to uh, pin down and demarcate. This was easy to demarcate, it was easy to see, and therefore it was therefore an effective uh, definitional position to kind of say, uh, I'll look for this, you know, it's almost maybe akin to, you know, the the stories about the red M and M's, whatever those those bands. They, you know, they, I forget who it is. They, there was one one some, I think, some musician. He goes on tour. He puts in his contract. You know, in my dressing room, only red M and M's or no red M and M's, whatever. And he goes into the dressing room and he looks and he sees if there's a red M and M. He he knows that they didn't read the contract carefully. And 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 and, and that it's also because he, I think, whoever this musician is, I don't remember. He does a lot of like stuff with like you know special effects and, you know, uh, smoke and little exploding things and, and his safety depends on them being really, really meticulous about reading the instructions carefully and so if there are red M&Ms in the dressing room, you know, okay. so sometimes you can like, it can be something which in and of itself isn't necessarily so important, but it's important to have things that you can look to uh, and, and know if this us or is this them and if there's no us or them, then, th then the community would have, you know, orthodoxy would have just dissolved uh, into this ascended conservative Judaism, and in fact, in many other more core ways, orthodoxy was becoming distinct from conservative Judaism in more significant ways already in the 50s and 60s, which will be the topic of next week's lecture, uh, kind of how things developed further, um, because it was, it was very hard to find other things that were so, the education of the rabbis was fairly similar, and the observance of the rabbis was fairly similar, the non-observance of the congregants was fairly similar uh, in, in that era. So here was something that you could see and clearly know. The risk is that, you know, um, sometimes th there's an inverse relationship between identity and content. <laughs> that when content is strong, you don't need as, your identity markers don't have to be as strong. And when content is, you know, is weak, then you instead like fall back on identity, you know, and, and sort of these more external markers. And maybe we'll get to this maybe in the last lecture, so maybe some of the contemporary polemics in modern orthodoxy and surrounding modern orthodoxy may be the outcome of like identity replacing, you know, um, content. We don't know, if we, we'll talk about it we don't know, we don't have a positive articulation of what it means to be a Jewish woman in 2017, so instead we use it as like, you know, police our boundaries by what women do and where in our synagogue life. And that may be, a, that may be about core content or it may be about uh, replacing content with boundary markers. So that's the risk, I guess. So there's a need for boundaries, but there's a risk that the boundary become more important than the thing itself that the boundary is supposed to demarcate. So I think we'll pause here. Uh, next week, uh, we take up our story from 1960s, 1980, the, uh, looking at day schools and the eclipse of non-observant orthodoxy. Okay, so thank you so much and have a good night.